Dear friends, it's an immense privilege to be with you again this morning in this virtual platform. And I want to invite you to wherever you are. Stop. Well, before we continue to just consume another video at this time, be aware of God's presence with you, where you are. Have in mind those that could usually worship with you in the church building, those that form part of the community of faith that you are part of, part of Melodi Atone, or part of another community if you are signing into this video from a different place, a different community. We welcome you. If we are gathered this community, even if it's a community spread over different places, because it is the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, through word and spirit gathers, protects, and cares for the church from the beginning of the world and will do to the end. And it is for that reason that I can greet you this morning. I can greet you in the name of God, the creator of all that exists, and of Jesus Christ, God that became human, lived among us, and of the Holy Spirit, God that it is working in us and through us and that is present in this world. Grace be to you. Peace on this day. We might not be able to, to sing together, but we can read the Psalms together. And I want to read a song of praise, a psalm of praise to us this morning, Psalm 128. Listen to these words. Sing it along in your heart. Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to Him. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessing and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Yes, this will be the blessing for the man who fears the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you live to see your children's children. Peace be on Israel. Friends, when we gather, also when we gather virtually, we do that as a community called by God. And I want to read a shortened version of the Confession of Belhar to us this morning. A confession that is born from our church. And a confession that speaks to what it is that the church should be. Usually we would say this uh, in response. But to this morning, just listen to these words. Confess them together with the church. Make it this your confession. This is what church believes. We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gathers, protects, and cares for the church through word and spirit. This God has done since the beginning of the world and will do to the end. We believe in one holy, universal Christian church, the communion of saints, called from the entire human family. We believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church as the community of believers. This unity must become visible so that the world may believe that separation, enmity, and hatred between people and groups is sin, which Christ has already conquered. Unity is therefore both a gift and an obligation. We believe that God has entrusted the church with a message of reconciliation in and through Jesus Christ, that the church is called to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world, that the church is called blessed because it is a peacemaker. Therefore, we reject any doctrine which, in such a situation, sanctions in the name of the gospel the will of God, the forced separation of people. We believe that God is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wronged. God brings justice to the oppressed and gives bread to the hungry. That God frees the prisoner and restores sight to the blind. That God supports the downtrodden, protects the stranger, helps orphans and widows. We believe that the church, as the possession of God, must stand where God stands, namely, against injustice and with the wrong. We believe that, in obedience to Jesus Christ, its only head, the church is called to confess and do all these things. Jesus is Lord. We will follow him. To the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. When we gather normally, we say together the words of I stand tall. And I want to invite you this morning, wherever you are, 
to, to say it out loud, not just in your heart. Say this out loud with a community spread out all over the city. Remember who you are. Remember who we all are. I stand tall and dignified in the presence of God and among my fellow human beings. I accept myself as a precious and unique person created through Christ to be the image of the living God. Together with animals, and trees, and rivers, we are one living community belonging to the earth, our common home. Guided by the Spirit, we discover who we are as a family. Moto, Kimoto, Kabato. Friends, when we gather as a community of faith, it is our practice to remember the sins in this world, those affecting us and those that we are part of. Listen to the words that we know well from 1 John 3. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Friends, where you have experienced the effect of sin on your life, where you have experienced being wronged by others, by society, by the systems of this world, God notes that. Let us, let us bring that before God. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy on us. For we have endured no end of contempt. We have endured no end of ridicule from the arrogant, of contempt from the proud. And if we plead with God, God responds to us and says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for prisoners. But listen to the words of 1 John 3 again. And now hear them also for the way that we are causing pain to others. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. You know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Pray these words together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And if we confess our sins to God, God responds and says, I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. My friends, I want to invite you to pick up your phone, and to send a message to someone in the congregation. Share God's peace this morning. Also with those that cannot gather in body with you. Let's remind ourselves, as we would have done, that God be, God's peace live among us. I want you to, to consider pausing the video, taking some time. If needed, give someone a phone call. Let's remind ourselves of God's peace. Let us pray together. Triune God, God who gathers us as a community, 
this morning as a community spread out. We are your people. We are your people that are seeking your will for our lives and for the lives of our communities, for the life of our city, our country and this world. Speak to us as we read ancient words together this morning. Amen. Friends, this, today's scripture reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans. I'm reading the first few verses from Romans chapter 12 to us. Romans chapter 12, from verse 1 until verse 8. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, that, you, that to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think yourselves with sober judgment, judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of you has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. In the times that we are living in, we might want to add to these well-known words that there is a time to lock down and a time to open our doors. There is a time for isolation and a time to bring our bodies together. There is a time for social distancing and a time for embrace. There is a time for separation and a time for community. This year has been an interesting example of re reminding us that the right thing also requires the right time. What may be the right, right in one time will not necessarily be right at another time. Knowing what the right thing is requires being sensitive to where we are and when we are. And the actions we took in March or in June will not be those we will take in September or in November. Our calling requires a constant sensitivity for where we are, reading the signs of the times. And in this year, the signs of the times perhaps included the warnings of epidemiologists and others who cautioned us about what would be required to keep each other safe. My sermon this morning is not focused on the question of whether it would be economically important to end various levels of lockdown and restart various activities. I remain convinced that as Christians, we do far more than merely figure out what the legal frameworks are within which we live. But we actively reflect on what it would mean to protect all God's people. Yet I do want to start reflecting with you this morning on what we need to think through in relation to our future communion. There is a time to recreate community and perhaps now is the time to start asking what really is important about our communion together. We know today that there is still a long road ahead of us. Only this week we read about setbacks in the development of COVID-19 vaccines. We are seeing so-called second waves of infections in various countries of the world. Epidemiologists in the USA are warning that it will be another year before anything resembling normality will return to that country. On the other hand, most of us experience over the past weeks an increasing return to normal. Our communities are opening up. I'm hearing of an increasing number of people relating how they've been able to see specific friends and family for the first time in months. Over the past weeks, and perhaps this is true for you as well, we remain vigilant, we remain wearing masks, 
keeping our distance, but we also need to start thinking about the future. But what is this normal that we are supposed to return to? We've been hearing about it for months, that life should return to normal. is a goal that many advocate for, that others hope for, that most of us assume, as a matter of fact, that it will return at some point. But is this really what we want? Did normal work for us? Did normal work for you? To speak in the language of faith, was normal God's dream for the world? Is normal the world God calls us to work for? And if your answer to this is a resounding no, and I suspect many of us have our doubts about the normal that we had, then perhaps it is now time to start thinking about the community that we do want. Not normal community, but the community that God calls us towards. And not only in the church, but in our neighborhoods, in our city, country, and world. The letter to the Romans is known for its big theological arguments. The church has turned to Romans repeatedly over the centuries to articulate our core beliefs. This is where Paul outlines the pillars of faith in great detail. Sin. Grace, faith. But in Romans 12, Paul shifts gears. He starts writing in a different tone. In the first chapters of Romans, if the first chapters of Romans provided the core theology, the systematic description of the fundamental aspects of how Paul understood God's work in Christ, then in chapter 12, Paul starts writing about life and how we live it. And that is how it should be. Because faith is about life. Faith is worked out in life, not in books and arguments, but in the way that we live together. And it is this life in community that Paul will be reflecting on from chapter 12 onwards. Because ethics, morals, is about life in community. And this is exactly in those moments where we are in relation to one another that we have to consciously reflect on how we should be living. It is the introductory word to this section of Paul's letter on which I want to focus today. While Paul is focusing the attention of the congregation on the new life in Christ, we are starting to focus on a life together that we will need to slowly rediscover in the coming months and years. But it is exactly a new life in Christ that should give rise to a hesitancy about a return to normal. The new life in Christ should caution us against too quickly assuming that things should just be what they are. Let's think about this normal some more. There is a deep irony in how laws were made to keep us apart over the past months, while the reality is that the normal of modern life is one where we have been forced apart for centuries. Social distancing is in fact not a response to COVID-19, but rather a normal part of modern life. We have been conditioned to live in fear of one another, to be cautious in our engagement with others, to keep each other at a distance. We do not trust each other. We undermine each other. The life that we are living can far too often be described as a dog-eat-dog -dog world. As people, we are responsible for immense pain in the lives of others. So maybe, as we start to think about what it would mean to move more, around more, to recreate our engagements, it is time that we reflect on the normalcy of social distancing of modern life. Perhaps it is time that we think anew about what our life together should, in fact, be. After all this, perhaps we will be able to look back on 2020 and out of this time with greater appreciation move towards community with each other. Because Paul's introduction about the life in Christ is also an introduction to the life together. It is in this morning's text that we find the well-known image of the body of Christ, a body with many members, a life lived in interdependency of one another. More than that, members that cannot survive, cannot live other than in being interdependent. The myth of the modern world was that of the self-sufficient man, yes, usually male, the person that owes no one anything, that isn't dependent on anyone for anything, who can get what he wants without any support from anyone. It was obviously a myth. And usually what remained hidden behind it was the many people trampled upon in the journey of success. Our isolation perhaps reminded us of our interdependence. And Paul would have reminded that like members of a body, we are dependent on each other. 
exactly because we are also different, bringing different gifts to the one body. I want to highlight a few things that Paul is speaking about. Paul starts by speaking of a deep conversion, a transformation of the mind so that we can discern the will of God. He calls the congregation to humility. Know your limits. Don't think more of yourself than you should. And the first point that he wants to build out of this concerns how our life together should look in order for the diversity in God's family, family to become visible and appreciated. This is a life formed by God in such a way that I myself live within the will of God. But rather than arrogantly trying to make others into clones of my own life with Christ, that in humility I recognize and accept the gifts of others and insist that these gifts should also form part of God's world. The normality to which many want to urgently call us back is in fact a normality of divisions, a normality of hierarchy, a normality of antagonisms between those who think differently, worships differently, looks differently from one another, a normality where each does their own thing with those similar to themselves. The community of a body is one where we have renewed appreciation for those members who have a different function than ourselves, while recognizing that we too have a critical function within the body. What would it look like if in the months to come we are slowly but sure we slow, slowly but surely start to decrease the social distancing between ourselves? But we specifically focus on those social distances that existed long before COVID nineteen appeared on our radars. What would it look like if we took those things that kept us apart for years and decades and if we com committed to disrupting these social distances, not a return to normal, but a turn towards God's future. If we choose to break down the borders between generations and languages, between nationalities and ethnicities, also in the church, so that we can note the gifts that each brings to the community. What if we do not return to normal, but rather are called into a new life with God and with each other, a life that looks different from before 2020? Exactly because our community is now deeper and broader than before. Let me conclude with a poem of Gloria Steinem. If we have more power than the people we are with, we need to remember to listen as much as we talk. If we have less power, we need to remember to talk as much as we listen. Both are difficult. Let us pray. God, as we focus on you this morning, as we sit in our various different places, we are deeply aware that we live in a broken and divided world. We confess that you are the one who brings unity, you are the one who breaks down divisions. But we also recognize that this is work that is ongoing. Work that you calls us to call us towards, and we want to give ourselves to not only return to normal, but to go beyond, to turn to you, and to recreate a new community in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our country, on the other side of this pandemic. Make us as a church into an experimental space for such community. An example of the vision that you have for our broader society. Use us in the places where we are, in the places where we have responsibilities, the places where we can make a difference. To heal this country, to heal our communities. To draw them towards that which you are calling us towards. Lord, we pray for our elected officials. We know that we are in a difficult time in many ways with immensely complicated decisions that need to be taken about our recovery and about the future of our country and our neighboring countries. We pray for your wisdom for all those who are in a place where they have to make these decisions. 
We pray that your love will guide these decisions. We pray that you will form us into people that will each give what we can, to give of ourselves to repair the brokenness in our society. Make us part of your recovery. A recovery of humanity. A recovery of life together. A recovery of justice for all. Use us in the work that you are doing in our society and in the world today. Amen. And before I say the blessing, I want to urge you to, wherever you are, continue to think about how we also give back in this time. If we were gathered in the church building, we would have had a collection, but continue to remember that we are also people who give from what we have received, and to do that in a way that God calls you towards uh, on various places, in the church, in society, but be, be conscious of the fact that we remain called to also give. Receive now the blessing of the Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.